Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from Atherton Uniting Church. We welcome you to this church service today, even though things are being done a bit differently. We welcome anyone who is visiting this site for the first time. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from the Word of God and then I'm going to call Johnson up to do his sermon. There will be not much singing in the service at all because at the moment we haven't organised that, but in the near future we will. So I'm going to commence this morning's service with a reading from Psalm 23. Please follow in your Bibles if you have one. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your star, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. May God have his blessing on this reading. And now I'd like to call Reverend Johnson to the uh, pulpit to do the rest of the service. Morning to you all. We just want to thank God this morning that we are doing the service uh, a bit differently. And uh, I just want to say, uh, because God is with us, we don't panic. So my theme today is stop panicking. Stop the panic. Stop the panic. I've read stories about hikers lost in the woods. They have some common features. At some point, everything starts to look and feel the same instead of moving forward. The lost hikers circle around and around endlessly until exhausted. They collapse in tears, resigned to never getting out. Sure, that journey is impossible, complicated, and ultimately vexed. Thankful, the helicopter or rescue vehicle snatches them from their lostness. And to their amazement, they discovered they were so very close to being found and freedom. If only they could have seen, seen where they were from, the perspective of above and not from below, things would have been good. Here is the rub. We can't. Discovering the thick and thin of it, the thin and thick of life from the thorns and thickets of life is part of our human condition. We see things up close and personal. All of us, in some sense, lack the big picture point of view. And so, when faced with venturing into new territories or navigating difficult and unknown terrain, it's easy for us to get disoriented, wander and aimlessly within our limited view of where we are and what we are doing there. That's the way life seems sometimes, doesn't it? Directionlessness, we are confused, or maybe we are avoiding going in a certain direction that we don't want to go in, but we know we have to go through it. Or maybe we're just dragging our feet, getting there. Sometimes we even think we are getting somewhere, learning a new thing, doing a new ministry, understanding a new concept, engaging in a relationship, that's important to us. Until one day, we are starting to realize we have gotten anywhere. We are essentially back where we have started. I'm just going in circles. Who hasn't cried that frustrating cry? That's the way we feel when we have no idea how to get ourselves out of the place of disorder, disorientation, directionlessness, waywardness, I'm just going in circles. Can also happen when we have get fearful, stressed out, anxious, or just plain freak out over where life is going. You think about this coronavirus, 
People are in a panic mode. They don't know what to do. And this is the situation where we are. What we often do when we feel we are going in circles is to blame someone else for putting us there. Remember the story of Adam and Eve. How did this happen when God asked? How did you get into this state? Adam, the woman you gave me, it's a fault. I am in this position. And remember, Eve, what about you? It was that serpent. He is the cause of all this. And what about the serpent? He strikes and whirls away. And that is what happens. As we know from our Genesis, generating origin story, blaming is just another way of going in circles. We can't get going in forward direction if we don't first take accountability of where we are, accept responsibility for how we got there in the first place. Blaming is easy, but that kind of finger pointing seldom gets us out. In fact, it almost surely secures us deep within. Like a whirlpool, it sucks us downward until we are lost somewhere in the chaos of our own dilemma, wading around in hopelessness, despair, sinking into a mad pit of confusion, disassociation that doesn't allow us easily to climb back out. If blessing is the ultimate connect, blaming is the ultimate disconnect. So that's the kind of wandering I can imagine happened on the trip from Egypt to the promised land. Now I know it's a long way, but look, Jesus and Mary and Joseph did it after Jesus' birth. Abraham did it, going to Egypt. Several others made the trip from Egypt and back again to the land of Canaan before that time. It may have taken about two weeks on foot, probably less, and the guys were supposed to be fleeing, right? So why heck did it take 40 long years for the Israelites to cross the desert from Egypt to the promised land? I suspect it has something to do with going in circles. So the Israelites were betwixt and between, but not because they were lost, but because they lost their self-awareness, lost their sense of accountability, lost track of their faith in God. You can't move forward when you are caught in the circle argument of the blame game. Before they could enter into the promised land, they had to stop longing for their life of the past. They had to wait to enter into that new place and into a truthful relationship with themselves, with each other, and above all, with God. Don't misunderstand. When they first got out of Egypt, it was like, all right, we did it. But... Pretty quickly, it turned into, what the heck did we just do? We have no idea where we are going or what we are going to find there. Do we really want to do this? How are we going to pull off this? And when the celebration ends, then the blaming starts. How many have found yourself in a relationship like that, in a new job like that? And yet God provides for them in wilderness place, in, the, in their in-between commitment, their kind of wish was faith, God provides sustenance, water, direction, and encouragement for the entire 40 years. Even when we are only half committed, Jesus is still making his presence known. In just last month, he saw many of his disciples begin to disappear. He saw so many still on the fence, not understanding God's love for them. Jesus taught furiously in those last months, trying like a villain shepherd to move forward out of the valley of despair and sh shadows into a place where they could accept from him the living water of eternal life. In the end, only a few were still with him. In the Exodus story, none of the original group make it to their destination, not even Moses. And still God is with them. What kept back? What took so long? Why couldn't they move forward over the finishing line? Most couldn't even get closer. It wasn't that God wasn't listening. It wasn't that God was providing. It wasn't even that the Israelites couldn't trust God would keep on doing the great things he's done. It was that they got so lost in their unfighting, their blaming, 
their fear of the future, their discomfort in feeling control of their destination, that they lost their ability to keep going in the direction they chose. They got so much caught in circles that they couldn't bring themselves to trust Moses to lead them through to their destination. What did they know anyway? They know, thought, he doesn't know what we find there any more than we do. And the feet dragging began, the bickering commenced, the arguing, the blaming, and the insecurity reigned. And before you know it, 40 years went by. 40 years, people, the Israelites are the ultimate procrastinators. But wait a minute. Are we so different from those guys? Are we so different from them? How long are some people willing to stay in abusive relationship? How long are people willing to drown their fears in alcohol or other escape instead of facing the things they need to do or decisions they need to make? How long are people willing to live in fear of taking the next step in their lives or committing to a new relationship for fear it may not work out? So the Exodus story is our story. Discomfort is a powerful force in our lives, isn't it? Especially the kind of discomfort that is driven by fear. Caused out of that panic, that only I call panic, procrastination, anger, nostalgia, infighting, and sexuality. The only way to get out of that place of panic, of being lost in the woods, that place of limiting and purposeless perspective is to somehow get out of the circle trap of blame and get back into the road of life. That's where Jesus came in, the good shepherd. In our case, God's helicopter driver. Driver, Don't get me wrong, Jesus is no helicopter parent. Hovering over us, guiding us from making mistakes or falling over here and there. Jesus is not in the business of hyper-monitoring our every move, correcting our very mistake. Jesus is not even opposed to taking the blame. We can't cast upon him. Like Moses, Jesus is willing to wait even more than 40 years if necessary for us to come around and find our way to the following year again. God is a patient God. And most of the time, God waits for us to figure things out, to follow his direction and to allow him to lead us once again forward into the land of milk and honey, by the still waters, to the green pastures where we can be at peace. Why do you do or what do you do when you find yourself lost in the woods? And going in circles. Stop. Calm. Just calm down. Take a deep breath. Take a stock of where you are. And find the signs that lead you forward. We too in our lives and in the life of the church need to do the same. We need to stop the panic. Stop in our tracks and stop a deep breath of the Holy Spirit's power. Be aware of Jesus' presence, of that shepherd's rod and staff that serves as both map and compass that allows us to make sense of again, of where we are and where we need to go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in green pastures. Jesus, who can calm our fears, restore our faith, steal our stubbornness, lift us into hope, Jesus is the only one we look in order to stop our minds from fighting and return us to the place of following. Jesus is the sign and signifier of our lives, the only signifier, the only compass of the church. The church should have the compass from Jesus Christ. As we are moving, let us not panic. This is the essence of repentance. Stop the panic. Let us not panic. Stop the blame. Turn from blaming to take responsibility for who we are in our journey. The direction we know we need to go. The courage we need to get there. And the one we need to follow. Whether it be in our personal lives, in our faith, or in the direction of our church, repentance means taking stock of our surroundings. Re-evaluating our position, our discipleship, our relationship, our commitment, and our faith. What means choosing a direction and following it forward. And that direction is always Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. God is a God of the ten and the God of return. The word for repent is to turn around the other way. Not just to go in a different direction, but to follow the direction of God. God knows we can't do it on our own. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. And that's why we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Stop the panic. 
Trust the Savior. Trust Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You should know that. Trust him. We don't need to leave our shadows behind. They fall us because they are our past and they remind us of where we have been. But meanwhile, we need to keep traveling towards the light. In this way, dark valleys, dark times, times of confusion, times of circling the forest, don't last. In this way, the times of the coronavirus will not keep us in panic mode. It will help us to understand who is in control, who is in charge, but only God. Jesus knows the way through the valleys to the waters, and we need him. Sometimes the emptiness and the panic of loss, where we have been, can envelop and swallow us up, where we need to go. Thick darkness makes it hard to see our way. That's why we need a shepherd who can bring us out of transitors into the eternal life. And that is very important for us to know. The word shaf in the 23rd Psalm restores. This is what God does for us. He restores us to the right path. The word shaf comes from tashuv. The word for repentance, it means to turn or retain, to allow ourselves to be led or guided into the right way. And that is what we need. So the returning of our souls to God, the relationship, God as a leader, and as we, follow, as we as followers, is the moment of healing that takes us from the shadow to walking in the awareness of the light. Even though we walk through the shadow of valley, of valley, it's just a shadow. It's not death. Shadow doesn't kill. So we Christians, we are not afraid of death, for we know where we are going. So it should not be a worry for us as Christians, but it should encourage us to say as Christians, in this time when the world is panicking, when everyone is panicking, we hold on to our faith because God is with us. And we know that God is with us. And he will never forsake us. He will journey us through the valley of the shadow of death. For we know that God is with us. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord help you this morning, wherever you are. He help you to give you comfort and rest and understand that God is in control. He is in charge of our situation. So worry not. Be happy. Be in Christ. From now and evermore. Amen.